I got a friend who goes to Hope to let me borrow his car, and I picked up Hope's founding pastor to get some answers. I bought you a little present. Is this your car? <laughs> no, it's not my car. I work at Hope. As we used and maybe abused this car a bunch, I dug deeper to get some perspective and backstory to help understand more about our why. Yes, we exist to love people where they are, and that will never change. But there is a second part of the why behind hope. Encourage them to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ. Can those two values coexist? We're increasingly in a culture where there are just almost no absolutes. And I don't even think people know what God has called them to or expects from them. And it, and the idea that it's not to bring you into bondage is actually to set you free and give you confidence in life. But you have to know what absolutes are. Sometimes I meet people who'd say they're gonna leave hope because they're looking for a more progressive church. Gotcha. What they mean is a church that's more flexible on the absolutes. Right. And I always tell people, we didn't write it. We don't have the right to change it. You know, if I got up one Sunday and said, hey, you know, we decided as as an elder board and a teaching team that we no longer wanted greed to be a sin. So from now on, greed's good, you know, and let's accept greedy people. People would go nuts. Well, you can't become like Jesus Christ until you realize what's keeping you from being like Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, you might think to love people where they are and not do the other is not actually loving people where they are. Well, it's like if you think you're a great parent, but you don't have any boundaries for your kid, you're not a great parent. Right. You're gonna, you're gonna raise very insecure kids. And I think it's the same way in our walk with Christ. There's confidence knowing what the expectations are and then allowing God through his spirit to kind of bring your life in line with the expectations. There's confidence there. I mean, there is that sense of invincibility. We're almost on empty. Where is there a gas station around here? I'm assuming it takes premium. It does definitely take premium, I asked them. Acting like it's cold. Check out the food. <laughs> I don't think you need to put gas in here. Well, we are, uh, we're in this series where we're answering the questions why, how, and what this whole church thing is about. And it's important for us to understand this because the Bible says that we are the church. So this is really our why. It's our how. It's what our lives should look like together as we, as we live them out. Now, there's this trend that's happening in our culture uh, really for about a week or so. I don't, I don't know if you've noticed it. And, and to be totally honest, I don't know why this is such a big deal. I don't know why people are doing it. Uh, as Americans, we spend millions, probably billions of dollars on anti-aging stuff, right? All kinds of things to try and, and make us look younger. And yet there's this trend going around right now where you take a picture of yourself, you put it through an app, and it makes you look older than you are, and then you post it for everybody to see it, right? Like, you've seen people on Facebook and, and on Instagram. People are putting it everywhere. And when stuff, I don't know why. I, I really, I don't know the why behind this. And when people do stuff like that, I tend to, to kind of go to the opposite side. I get a little rebellious. I'm like, I'm not going to do it because everybody else is doing it. But uh, I was talking with my son, Ty, the other day, and, uh, and he said, Dad, you, you really should do it. And I was like, I, I don't know. And he's like, you know it would be great. You should do it on Sunday, on Saturday morning, Sunday, Saturday night, Sunday morning. You should do it in front of everybody, right? And so, so you should, they should take your picture and then show what you're going to look like when you're older and just kind of reveal it to everyone. I was like, Ty, that is a terrible idea. So we're going to do it. And, uh, and uh, so that's what we're going to do. So our tech team's incredible. They, uh, they said if, if I just like pose in just a second and they'll take a picture, they're going to run it through the app and then they're going to they're gonna show all of you what I, what I will look like when I, when I get older. I, I don't know why we're doing this, but we're, we're going to try it. So I, I just hang in there. I got I to gotta pose. Yeah, okay, that was awkward, but I think they got it. They got a picture of me. They're going to run it through the app and it should just take a second. They're going to show us what I look like when I get older. Wow! Wow! That's like a fine bottle of wine right there, right? It's just getting better with age. Apparently, I'm going to get a better tan, and my arms are going to triple in size. This is a, I am so excited. I'm so excited to get old now. Oh, that's a, a fantastic. Now, I know, I just should feel like I should say, too, I know some of you are really good friends with Mike. Remember, this was my son's idea, right? I had another, I like my job, and uh, I would like to keep it. But I don't know why people are doing this, but, but they're doing it, right? That question, why, I think it is one of the most important questions that we can ever ask in our lives. 
Because if we don't know the why, then we don't do, right? Like, I'm not going to do something if I don't know the why behind it. If I'm not convinced with the why, I'm not going to act in, in any kind of way towards it. And so we're talking about our mission as a church. We're talking about why we do the things that we do, why we are who we are. And so let me just remind you what our mission is. It's, it's this. It's that we love people where they are, and we encourage them to grow in their relationship with Jesus Christ, right? And Chase started this message last week. He talked about the first part of what it means to love people where they are. He did a phenomenal job. If you didn't hear that message, you need to go back online and you need to watch that message. It was incredible, right? And so we're gonna kind of pick up from there and we're gonna talk about the, the second part of that, of why this matters and why this is so important for us in our lives. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever had a time in your life where you experienced a, a feeling, like where you felt like you were made for more in life? You ever had that feeling? Like maybe it was during a hard time in life, maybe a relationship that, that's just not going the way you thought it was. Maybe it's a, a dating relationship. Maybe your marriage isn't in the place that you thought it was gonna be by this kind of stage in life. Maybe it's your relationship with your kids. Maybe it's a financial thing, right? Like I, I didn't think I would be in this place or like right now. Maybe it's a job, career thing. I thought I would be further along in my career. Maybe it's a habit. Right, it's just kind of taking root in your life. And you're like, I, I realized that I was struggling with this earlier. I didn't think this was going to be a deal in my life now, right? Like you get to that, that place, right? And maybe you're asking yourself or saying to yourself, I was made for more than this, right? Like this can't be what my life is all about. Or maybe the opposite is true for you. Maybe someone, maybe someone saw something in you that you didn't even see in yourself, right? And, and they pulled that thing out of you, right? And all of a sudden you did it and you experienced it and you're like, wow. Maybe I was made for more than this. When, when I was in high school, um, I played hockey. I grew up in Canada, and so that's, that's what we do. And, and when I was a rookie in high school on our high school hockey team, uh, we had a really good team. And uh, we won almost every game uh, during, our, during my rookie season. Uh, we were kind of cruising through the playoffs. Laura's high school, my wife Laura, it was, a, it was one of our rival high schools. We destroyed them, right? Like we, we, just, we had a fantastic team. And we were in a, a round of playoffs where the winner of this this two game series between us and this other high school would go to what would be equivalent to all states right for us right but we don't have we don't have states in Canada so it was all provinces so it would be it would be the Ontario championship the top 16 teams from all of the high schools in on, in Ontario and so we were in this, in this playoff with this other team, and it was two games. They had a home game, then we had a home game. The total goals for both of those two games combined, that would be, the winner would move on to that next round and go to be one of the top 16 teams. And so we began, we went to their arena, and, and we, like, we walked on them, right? Like, we had a, a great start. We actually beat them by three goals. And so when we came back to our arena for game two, it, it was, the place was electric, right? They let out our entire high school. I think our entire high school was in the arena cheering us on. And literally on the scoreboard, we had three. It was three nothing for us before, before the puck was even dropped, before the game even started. And so we started the game, and, and I was a defenseman, and I had played all season, even as a, as a rookie I had played. But as the game went on, right, our coaches were, were kind of losing a little bit of confidence in, in us, right, because we gave up one goal, and then we gave up an, another goal, and then we gave up a, a third goal. And next thing we know, it's tied, and the, the game is over, and it's now going to go into to overtime. And so the rookies, we kind of got benched, right? They went to the, the better players, the veteran players, the older players on our team. And so I didn't play, so I hadn't played since the second period. So I had sat there during the third period. I'd sat there during the first overtime. Nobody scored. And I was sweaty, and, and now I'm sitting in an arena, and I'm cold, and, and, and right? And, and I just, I wasn't feeling great at that point. And, and then uh, our players, our team, they, they were just exhausted. And so I remember the defensive coach, he leaned over and he said, Peters, I want you to go out there for one shift to give the good players a rest, right? And I was like, oh, thanks coach, I appreciate that. And then he grabbed me by my face mask and he pulled my face right into his face and he said this, don't screw this up, right? And I was like, oh, hey, thanks for the vote of confidence, right? Like, and so I remember the guy that I was replacing, he came to the, the bench and I jumped over the boards and I went there and all that's in my head is, is don't mess this up, don't mess this up. Like, don't be that guy, right? The, the, the thing ends because of, of me. And so we were in the offensive zone, we were in their end and, and the puck came back to me and I stepped around a guy and I had a shot on net and I took the shot and I scored the game-winning goal in double overtime to send us to the All-Ontarios for us. Yeah, you can cheer for that. That's, 
That was my highlight of high school hockey right there. Right? And I went down. You don't think I would have told the story if I didn't score, would you? Like, I was, I'm not going to tell that story if it wasn't me. Right? And so I scored. There, and the, the arena went nuts. And the entire team, they came and they jumped on me and, and mobbed me. Right? It was, it was just one of those moments. And afterwards, we were, I, was, I was being interviewed by the media or the local newspaper. That's all it was. But, I, but I, was, I was just talking to the reporter. And that same coach, he walked by. He didn't stop. He didn't, he didn't glance. He didn't do anything. He just walked by and he said, his eyes were closed the whole time, right? <laughs> I was like, man, you got the spiritual gift of encouragement, right? Like, this is, it was so good. Well, I worked really hard that next year and that off season, right? Because I didn't want to be just the guy that, that they put on the bench because they couldn't trust. I wanted to be the guy that was out there the entire time. And that next season, our head coach came to me and he said, Donnie, we've seen how hard you've worked. And we believe in you. I believe in you. I want to make you one of the captains of the team. I want you to lead us back to the all Ontarios this year. And it was so reminded, right, the, the, the two different voices that we all have in our lives. The voice of less, right, the voice that says that other people are better than you are. The voice that says, don't mess this up. The voice that says, he just got lucky, his eyes were closed anyways. And the voice of more that says, I believe in you. I, I want you to lead us. I believe you can take us to where it is that you want us, that we want to go. See, you were made for more. And I think it's so important that we understand this. You were made for more than, than just spending your time doing whatever it is that you want to do. You were made for more than just earning a paycheck to pay the bills or just to buy the toys that you want to buy. You were made for more than just feeling good about yourself. You were made for so much more, and especially if you're a, a follower of Jesus, right? We were made for more than just being a, a convert to Jesus. You were made for more than just being a member of a church. You were made for more than just dropping your kids off in Kid City or middle school or high school. You were made for more than to drive around with a, with a Hope bumper sticker on the back of your car, cutting people off and flipping them off as, as you do, right? Don't do that. That's why I don't have one on my car, right? So that people don't know, don't know where we come from. You were made for more. In fact, I would say you were made for so much more. So you were made to experience life to the fullest. You were made to overcome all of the negative feelings that you have and habits that you have. You were made to be emotionally healthy. You were made to have healthy, loving relationships in your life. You were made to have answers to your prayers. You were made not to live in fear, but to live in confidence. You were made for so much more. And, and I think we talk about a lot of that here on the weekends on, on a regular basis, but there's one thing that, that I want to make sure that we, sometimes maybe we miss this. There's one more thing that you were made for. You were made to help people grow in their relationship with Jesus. See, here's the problem. I've been a, I've been a pastor for, for a long time now. And, and what I see most of the time is that very few Jesus followers are living that life of more. In fact, I would say that a lot of us, we're settling, we're settling for less. We just kind of show up, right? We, we try not to hit too many roadies so, as we're trying to park as close to the front doors as, as we can. We, we come in, we want to make sure that we get our coffee and, and our seat, and it better be the way that we want it and, it, and and it better be good for us, right? Maybe, maybe we show up a couple times a semester to a small group. Maybe I serve once a month. But what if the answer to why this matters, or what if it actually comes from an understanding that we were, we were created for more than just to show up? sitting here and soaking in another message, that we were created to live out the mission that God has called us to, that you were created to grow in your relationship with God, and then you were, you were called to go and to help other people grow in their relationship with Jesus as well. See, Jesus' purpose for his disciples, and a disciple is just this, it just literally means someone who, who follows Jesus, who wants to be like Jesus. God, Jesus' purpose for us has always been to make disciples who go make disciples, right? Followers of Jesus that go and, and help other people follow Jesus. And so we're called to go love people where they are, to encourage them to grow in their relationship with him. Here's the bottom line of this. If, if you have to leave early, this is what this is about. You were created for more than just to sit and to soak. You were created to grow and to go. Let me show you four reasons why our mission matters and why living this out matters. Here's the first one. It's because Jesus modeled it. One day, there was a bunch of religious leaders, and they gathered around, and they tried to trap Jesus, and they said, Jesus, what's the greatest commandment, right? There's all kinds of rules and commands. What's the greatest one? And here's what Jesus said, Matthew 22. He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and all your mind. He said, this is the first and the greatest commandment. 
And Jesus easily could have stopped there, right? But he, he doesn't. He says this. He says, and the second one, the second one is just like it. He says, you love others, you love your neighbor the way that you love yourself. See, Jesus is so amazing, right? I mean, this is, this is the ultimate answer, right? Like, I imagine, I imagine he might drop a scroll after this, right? He was just like, boom, right? I'm done. I'm walking away. Because this is the perfect answer. Love God. Love others. It's that simple. That's how we live our lives, right? And when you think about it, you love God. And when you love God with all that you have, when you love God with all that you are, right, with all of us, then what that means is that I should never want to do anything that would hurt God. I should never want to do anything that would, that would go against what God has told me to do. I shouldn't go against those things. But here's the incredible part of God too, right, is he knows that we're human. He knows that we're not perfect, that we make mistakes. And so even in that, he took all of that into context and said, you know what, I know that you're going to mess up. And even when you do, I'm not going to stop loving you. It's not, you've got to love God with all your heart and soul and mind. And you only get one shot to do it. And so you better be perfect at it. He says, I know you're going to mess up at times. And I'm going to love you anyways. And I'm going to love you through that. And I want you just to love me more the next time than you did the last time. And every single day, just love me more and more and more with every word, with every thought, with every action, with every habit. But, but he also said that we love others, right? Not just the ones that we like, not just the ones that are easy to love, not just the ones that we benefit from, right? When I love that person, I get free tickets to something, right? Like, he said, not just that. He said, I want you to love everyone and not the way that we want to love them. I want you to love them the way that they need to be loved. I want you to love them where they are. See, this wasn't just a theory for Jesus. He modeled it. In fact, in 1 John 4, 19, he said this, we love, or sorry, Jesus didn't say this, but he says, we love because he first loved us. Because Jesus modeled this, we love in response. See, loving God is the greatest thing that we can do with our lives. It's absolutely the greatest. But Jesus says, you know what? The other is, is just as important. And because he loved us this way, that becomes the example for us to follow in our lives of how we treat, of how we serve, of how we love the people around us as well. Paul, one of the followers of Jesus, he said, this is very, very serious. Let, let, me, let me show you in Romans 12, he said this, don't just pretend to love others, but really love them. Don't just say it, do it, right? Love people. The clearest example of Jesus modeling the mission for us was found in one event in history. It was that moment that Jesus made the decision that I'm going to not only love people where they are, but I'm going to love you too much to leave you where you are. And so he went to the cross. And in our place, he took our sin. He took our mistakes. He took our, our attitudes, our garbage, right? He took all of that stuff upon himself. He was perfect. He was sinless. He had, he had never done anything wrong. And, and so he didn't have to do that. But he said, I'm going to, to take all of your sin, all of your stuff upon myself, and I'm going to give you in exchange my right standing with God. Your filth, your sin, your mistake. And get it, every single one of us is guilty, myself especially. He said, I'm going to take that on myself, and I'm going to give you my perfection in exchange. He said, I'm going to love you where you are, but I'm going to love you too much to leave you where you are. Colossians 2.14 says this, he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. All right, that's love. It's this free gift that is offered to everyone through faith in Jesus, that every single one of us, and Jesus modeled this loving people where they are, but caring too much to, to leave them there for us. And so if our goal is to be like Jesus, which is what our goal should be, then, then this should be the model of our lives as well. This is how I want to live. This is how I want to learn to love other people. Here's the second reason why this matters. It's this. It's because Jesus commanded it. See, Jesus modeled why our mission matters, but he also commanded, he also told us to, to be a part of this. See, if the only thing that mattered was, was being saved from our sin, right, if that was it, then at the moment that you put your faith in Jesus, the moment that you prayed a prayer or you said, God, I, I confess my sin to you, at that very moment, it would have been... Right, straight to heaven, right? Like, like, and, and if that was it, right, that, that would be a weird thing. Right? For most of us, we probably would go to the nicest restaurant, we order the most expensive meal that we couldn't afford, and right when the check came, we were like, Jesus, I love you, right? And boom, go straight, straight home, right? And, and it'd be happening all over the place. Here's the problem. Here's why this is not God's plan. 
right? It's not just get saved and go straight to heaven because there would be no one left to tell other people where everybody went. It just seems that everybody goes to fancy meals and then boom, straight to heaven. I don't know what's, I don't know what's happening here. God said, that's not the plan. Yes, yeah, salvation is essential, but God left us here for a reason. He left us here so that we would grow in our relationship with him and he left us here so that we would help other people grow in their relationship as well. Jesus' purpose has always been for his disciples to go and to make disciples. In fact, it was his very first words to his disciples, to his followers. In Matthew 4, 19, he said this, Come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. He said, guys, here's what I want you. I want you to come hang with me. Come live like me. Come listen to me. Come be like me. Be a follower of me. Grow in your relationship with me. And then I'm going to send you out to go fish for other people. I'm going to send you out to go make other disciples. I'm going to send you out to you so you can go and help people grow in their relationship with Jesus as well. He modeled it. But, but, but that wasn't just the, his first message. In fact, in the middle, in, in Luke chapter 9, Jesus sent out his disciples. He said, I want you to go and I want you to practice this. And so he sent them out to go and to love people where they are and, and to encourage them to grow. And they came back and they shared all the stories of what happened while they were out there doing it. And, and, and that wasn't enough either. Because Jesus repeated it one more time. It was, in fact, his last words while he was here on earth. In Matthew 28, he said this. Jesus came to them and he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples, followers of Jesus, of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely, I am with you always to the very end of the age. See, when someone's dying, when someone's leaving, right, their last words matter. We lean into those last words, don't we? Because they're significant to that. In, in Jesus' last words, there's significance to this. He gives us a few truths from his last words that are, are still so relevant to us today. The first is this, and that all authority has been given to Jesus. What does that mean? That, that, because if we're under Jesus, right, and, and Jesus has all authority, what does it mean for us to be under, under Jesus' authority in our lives? Let me, let me kind of define it like this. It's believing the voice of and the words of Jesus over any other message. He's saying, Jesus, I'm going to listen to your voice. I'm going to listen to your message. That's what's going to shape my life. Not all the other voices, not all the other messages that are out there. I want your voice, your message to shape and direct and to guide my life. That, that's it, right? It's just a choice that we simply make. See, if you live your life long enough, you're going to discover that you're going to be surrounded by all kinds of people that have all kinds of different voices and all kinds of different opinions on what you should do with your life. And people that will tell you what you can't be. And people that will tell you what you can't have. And people that will tell you what you can't do. Jesus will never be one of those voices. Jesus is always the voice of more. That's who I want to follow with my life. The voice that will guide me through life. Because if, if God knows everything, and he does, by the way, right? He knows everything. And, and God is in control of everything. And God always has my best interest in, in mind, right? And God loves me unconditionally. And God has all authority over, over everything. That's who I want to follow. Because that is always going to lead to more in my life. See, not only were you made to listen to the authority of Jesus, but you were also made to participate in, in Jesus' strategy. He said, therefore, what? He said, therefore, go. And in fact, that word go, in, in the Greek, it's, it's this word, it's called uh, poriomehi, and, and that's, what, that's what it is in Greek, and it literally means to travel or to depart or to go, to, to take a journey. Now, I'm not smart, right? I gotta look all of this stuff up and, and whatever, and, and, and so it's really, it's actually less of a command. It's, it's called a, a present participle, and here's what it literally means. It literally means this, that as you go, Right, that as you do life, as you're going about from your, your daily stuff, right, wherever you're going in your agenda, whatever it is that you're doing today, as you go, you make disciples. Every relationship, every opportunity. So when you go to work, you make disciples. High school students, when you're on your campus, when you're at football practice, when you're in band, you make disciples. Stay at home parents. Your children are your primary disciples, but you also disciple the other parents that you come in contact with at different times. 
For those of you that your kids play soccer or some other sport, right, when you're at the soccer games, the, the coach, the influence you have, make disciples. The other families and parents that are there, you make disciples. Everywhere you go, you make disciples. Now, I know some of you are, are thinking. Some of you are like, Donnie, I, I don't know how to do that. Right? Like, do, do I have to go to school or something for that? There's got to be a, a class or something that, that I need to take. Hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Isn't that what Mike and, and you, like the other pastors, isn't that what you guys are, are paid to do, right? Like that's, that's your job. And, and, and yes, yes, that is what, what we're paid to do, right? But here's the deal. We're, we're all supposed to do this. Every single one of us has been called into ministry. For some of us, it's our job. We get paid to do this. For some of us, we're paid to be good. For the rest of you, you're good for nothing. That's how this works, right? That's what God's called you to. You were created to do this. And you see, it doesn't matter. You, you may say, well, Donnie, I was a surprise to my parents. That's fine, but you weren't a surprise to God. See, there may be unplanned pregnancies. There has never been in the history of the world an unplanned person. God always has a plan for our lives. See, it's really hard to surprise an omniscient God. And God knows everything. There's never been a day where God was up there in, in heaven and goes, wow. Never saw that coming, right? Like, I, I didn't know that was going to happen. That's never happened. And so if that's true, then, then, that's, then this is also true. The things that, that take us by surprise, right, the things that come into our lives that we didn't see coming, they're not a surprise to God, which means that this is also true, that he's already at work on the solution before you even knew there was a problem in your life. That's how incredible God is. That's the God that we follow. See, God has a role for you a role for you to play in his redemption plan, and you are so critical to what it is that God wants to do. What's my role? Well, it's simple. As, as you go through life, you grow in your relationship with Jesus, then you help other people to grow in their relationship with Jesus as well. And here's maybe the most amazing news out of that passage. It's this, is that Jesus promised to never leave us alone. He said that he will always be with us, right? I mean, how, how incredible is that? He's never going to leave us alone to, to do this by ourselves. You see, we have to understand when, when Jesus is having this conversation with his disciples, it's just a, a handful of days after his resurrection, right? And even some of his disciples, some of them are still, they're confused. Some of them didn't even believe that Jesus was Jesus yet, right? Like they're still, they're not sure what it is that they've just gone through and what it is that they've experienced. And yet Jesus proceeded to entrust the, his world mission, his world mission to these ordinary Ordinary men, think about that for a second, right? That God, God chose limited, broken, sinful people as his main vehicle to take the most important message that the world has ever known. And he gave it to them and said, I want you to take it and share it. See, God could have done all kinds of things, right? Angels could have showed up and, and, and told us what to do, or, or maybe he could have just kind of parted the clouds and, and he could have just spoken audibly to us. He could have gone back to some of the things that he had done in, back in the day, right? He could have lit, lit a bush on fire and had a burning bush moment. Or, or, or maybe he could have had some stone tablets again with some writings on that would have helped us. Maybe he could have spoken through a donkey again. Some of you would argue that he's doing that right now. That's okay, right? I'm all right with that. Because God chose ordinary men and women to carry his message of salvation to the world. See, in, in the early church, they were so committed to living out this mission, to taking it everywhere. It says this in Acts, in Acts 17, 6. It said that the, they said this, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. See, the gospel of Jesus still has the power to turn the world upside down. Here's the third reason. It's because we all need it. Albert Einstein said, uh, once you stop learning, you start dying. See, we all have room to grow. Every single one of us, right? If you're really good at something, there's room to get better. And if you want to be good at something, then you need a, a coach. You need someone specialized, better than you, to help guide you through. Let me give you an example. Right, you think about football team and you think about like a bunch of kindergartens playing flag football and there's like 15 of them and they've got one coach, right? Because they're not very good and, and they just kind of run around the field. No one can throw the ball and they don't need a bunch of plays. They don't need a playbook. They're really just looking forward to oranges and a Gatorade afterwards, right? Like that's, that's really what their whole goal is. But you elevate that a little bit. You get into high school 
And when I was in high school, we had three coaches. We had a head coach and an assistant coach and the water boy, right? And, 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 we, and we had more specialized coaches. Now, we weren't any good. We didn't win a single game while I was in high school. But, but it was a little bit better than, than those kindergartens playing flag football. But when you look at a college game or you look at a professional game, Right, when you turn on the TV and, you, and they pan the, the sidelines, it, it seems like half of the guys there right, are wearing khakis and visors. Right? There's, a, there's a head coach and an offensive coach and a defensive coach and a, and a running back coach and a quarterback coach and a special teams coach and a kicking coach and a strength and conditioning coach and a, and a, and a defensive back coach. And, and there's the coach that, that goes to class and gets you out of trouble coach. Right? Like there's all of these different coaches in play. Why? Because these guys are specialized. Because they're at an elite level, and so it takes specialized coaches to help them get to that next level. See, if you want to be the best dad that you can be, then you need to get a a godly godly dad who will coach you through what that looks like in your life. If you want to be a great leader, you have to surround yourself with people who are going to speak uh, spiritual leadership principles into your life so that you can get better at that. I've got people in my life that mentor me in leadership. I have people that that mentor me in, in God's word. I have counselors who, who teach me and help me to find balance in my life at times. I've, we've had people that have helped us manage our money. I've had um, different people who have helped me to become a, a better husband and a better, a better father. I have an accountability partner that holds me accountable. Why? Because I'm a mess. And it takes that many people just to keep me from blowing my life up, right? Like we all need those people in our lives. Ephesians 4 says this. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, right? That old self, that before Jesus self, says you were taught. You have people who have been teaching you. You don't live that way anymore. You, you want to say no to those things. You want to push that stuff away. That's not who you are anymore. But look what it says. Instead, you want to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. So we need those coaches. We need those people who are better than us in those areas that will guide us and help us to become better in our lives. We all need people to help us grow. Who are those people in your life? Mike Lee is one for me. When we uh, we applied uh, for this job or or interviewed, I guess, um, several years ago, uh, it was at Easter, and, uh, and we had some immigration stuff that we were going through, and so we were offered the job at Easter. We had to go back to Canada because we were deported and yada, yada. Um, but uh, we didn't end up actually getting to Hope until December. It took that long, from Easter to December before we actually got here. And in between, while we were back in Canada, my, fa- my father died. And it was one of the hardest things that I've ever had to go through in my life. And when we moved here in December, you know, Mike, Mike never said anything about that. He, he didn't say, I'm going to be your father, right, and I'm going to step in. But he did. He stepped into my life. And he and Laura have been so incredibly generous. They invited us to all kinds of family things, right? It's, a, it's the entire Lee family and then us. Like, we just show up because we didn't have family here. And so they brought us into those things. We have vacationed together. We've smoked cigars together. He answers my text when I text him. He loves Laura and Ty so much. And he cares so much about me. Mike is like a father to me. But he's also my pastor. He knows my past mistakes. He he answers my questions when I ask him. I watch him and how he lives his life. I watch how he prepares to teach a message. I watch him when he teaches. I listen to how he prays. I watch how he dresses. I can't pull it off, but I watch it anyways, right? I know I need to lift a lot of heavier things if I want my arms to get bigger. I've got a long way to go in that. But that's it. It's not a seminary class. Mike doesn't sit me down and say, open up a textbook and let me me tell you, let me coach you how to get better. He just simply loves me too much to leave me where I am. And so he speaks more into my life. Those of you that are a little older, those are a little more mature, I, I just want to talk to you for a second. So one of the things that I hear a lot around campuses is that from the younger adults, from our younger families is, man, I wish someone was around to help me. I wish I had someone to mentor me, to coach me, to, to kind of show me, because I don't know what to do in this, and that we've never been in this situation before. But I also hear this sometimes from people that are in their 50s or 60s or 70s. Man, I love our church, but I wonder if I'm just not too old for it. And I want to say this to you. That's one of the stupidest things that you can say, with all respect, right? With all re- it really is, because this church is filled with people that absolutely need you. 
The Bible says that the older women, right, are supposed to train the younger women. We have hundreds, thousands of younger women that are looking for godly models, people that will help them to take their next steps. Men, we have so many men that are trapped in materialism, right? They don't know how to be good leaders in their homes or, or at work or, or in their communities. We have so many men that are giving in to all kinds of lustful desires, and they need someone who is older than them who has overcome those things. We'll say, I'm not perfect, but, but let me speak life into you. Let me speak truth back into your life. We have so many teenagers in our middle school and high school ministry that need people to step in and mentor them. We have so many kids in our children's ministry that need disciples, need disciple makers, people that come alongside them and encourage them and teach them what God's word says. So you are called to go and to make disciples. It is your most important life assignment. That as you go, whatever it is that you're doing, you help people grow in their relationship with God. I want you to feel that. I want you to believe that. I need you to embrace that because we have to, we have to become that for this last reason. And it's this, it's because someone needs you. You may know them. It may be someone you're related to. It may be someone that you've never met before, but there is someone that needs your help. Philippians 3 says this, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. 1 Corinthians 11.1 1 says this, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. See, someone needs you to help them grow in their relationship with Jesus as well. I want to ask you a couple questions, and I, and I want you just to put your hand up. If you're like, yeah, that, that remotely, that's probably true in my life most of the time. I, I want you just to participate, because I want you to own this for, for just a second. If you're married, right, married couples out there, how many of you would say, my marriage is not perfect, right? It, it's not, but for the most part, we have a solid, growing Christian marriage. How many of you would say that? There's some guys right now that are looking at their wives. They're like, can I put my hand up? Like, can I, can I say, can I say, if you asked your wife, yes, and you know, you've already figured out the whole marriage thing, right? That's the way to do it. Put your hand up strong. Be confident with that. that that's great. For some of you, where you work, where you go to school, wherever it is that you do life, how many of you would say that, that you have a, a strong Christian witness, that the people around you know that you're a follower of Jesus? How many of you would say that? That's great. How many of you would say that you have, a, you have a basic understanding of prayer, right? Like you know how to pray and, and when you do, God often answers some of those prayers. That's fantastic. How many of you would say that you have a pretty good understanding of the Bible? You don't have all the answers, right? Like you don't know where everything is, but you have a pretty good understanding. Good. How many of you own a Bible? Great. Baby steps, right? That's awesome. We can, we can work with that. That's, that's fantastic. Parents, parents, how many of you would say, I'm a parent, our kids are not perfect, but we've made, we've made enough mistakes for like a couple generations, right? Like we could help somebody not make the mistakes that we've made. How many parents could say that? Financially. How many of you would say this, that, that I haven't always made the best decisions, but, but we're figuring it out, right? That, that I recognize that being a, a borrower is, is being a slave to a lender, right? And so we've gotten out of debt or we're, we're getting out of, of debt, and now we have some margin, and now I can be more generous with what God has given me. I understand some basic principles of how to leverage my money to help build the kingdom. How many of you would say that, that you're at that place financially? One more. How many of you have been hurt by someone, been betrayed by someone, and the power of the Holy Spirit is, has led you to a place that supernaturally you were able to forgive someone or, or, or something that most people would say, that, that's unforgivable, and yet you've been able to get there. Can I say this to you? You're ready. You're ready. You have everything you need to go and make disciples. You have the authority of Jesus. You have all of the experience, all of the gifts. You have the word of God. You have the promise that Jesus is with you always. You were called to go and make disciples. So there's people in your life, people around you, that you may be the only one that God uses to introduce them to Jesus, to help them to grow in their relationship with him. It doesn't mean that you're better than them. It just means that you're a little further down the road than they are. Can I promise you something? Here's, here's a promise I'd love to make. Nothing will cause you to grow more. Nothing will cause you to grow faster in your relationship with God than to help somebody grow in their relationship with Jesus. Love people where they are. But love them too much to leave them there. See, so you were created for more. More than to just sit and soak. You were created to grow and you were created to go. 
So what do we do with this this week? Let me just give you two things. It starts by recognizing that you were made for more, right? We've got to lean in. We've got to make the decision that I'm going to let Jesus be the voice in my life and not all the other voices that are out there. But when you get to that place, here's the two questions. The first is this, what, what's your next step? See, Mike's, that's what, Mike's going to talk about that for the next five weeks. He's going to show us what does this look like? How does this play out in our lives? How do we grow in our relationship with God? So you've got to come back to be a part of this because it's going to be so important for you to help take those next steps, both for you and to help others as well. But who in your life, what, what is it that, where do you start growing? What do you say no to? What do you need to say yes to? Who, who do you need to invite in to begin to coach you? And here's the second question. Who can you help take their next step? See, the best life that you're ever going to live this side of eternity is when you recognize that God could use you to impact the life of someone else, to encourage them to grow in their relationship with God. Nothing will compare to that ever. So would you just pray today, God? Would you just show me? Who is it that you want me to come alongside? What ministry do you want me to get involved in? How could I make a difference in the life of someone else? Will you bow with me as we pray? God, we thank you that we were created for so much more. God, there are some of us that are here today. And for some of us, we just need to take that very first step and we need to place our life under the authority of Jesus. Some of us have never done that. And we're just, we're living life on our own. We're trying to figure it out as we go. We're trying to solve all our own problems and deal with all our own issues and, and, and take all of our own guilt and our shame and all of that stuff and that mess. And, and, and maybe for the very first time today, we're recognizing that I can't deal with that on my own. And I don't need to because Jesus, you already dealt with that for me. Maybe for the very first time, some of you are, are recognizing that you were made for so much more. And if that's you, would you just pray just in the quiet of your heart you just say this, Jesus, I believe that you are God and I believe that I'm not. And so I thank you for giving your life for mine that through your death and through your resurrection that you've offered me life and you've offered me forgiveness and you have offered me hope. So God, I confess my need for you and I give my life to you today. So if you pray that prayer, it is the greatest decision you will ever make in your life. God, we pray that today for so many of us here that we recognize that you are the voice of more. Many of us are followers, but God, we're, we're not necessarily listening to your voice. We're listening to the voice of so many other things, so many other things that are distracting us. Today, God, I pray that you would help us to choose to listen to you over everything else. That God, we would say before we leave today, I am yours, God. God, that we would commit to start making disciples in our lives. For some of us to, to go serve in, in Kid City and make disciples there. For, for some of us to go into student ministries and, and to begin to mentor and to lead and to guide students there. Father, maybe to get connected to a small group, maybe to start a small group. Father, for some of us to ask someone to mentor us, to coach us, to guide us. Or Father, for all of us to lean into someone else and say, let me come alongside you. Let me just share what I've learned. I, I don't have all the answers, but I, I may be just a little bit farther down the road than you are. Jesus, thank you for loving us. Thank you for choosing us to be a part of your strategy to change the world. God, what an incredible honor that is. Jesus, we love you and we thank you. We pray all these things in your powerful, powerful name.